Hello, everybody. I tried to book a larger room, which didn't work out. I mean, obviously. Um, and um, also, the same deal applies. February 6th, Edward Soya will speak also in this room. Um, and uh, for the rest, you know, it is, of course, the fault of the speaker to write such good books that the room is too small. Um, thanks also to uh, Susan and Duncan Malicham, homesick at the moment for supporting Malicham clusters and occasions such as this, contributing to campus life and scholarship. When I studied at SUNY Binghamton in the 80s, one of my prized possessions was a double issue of insurgent sociologists. Yeah. Edited by Bill Domhoff. And devoted to power structure analysis, which showed intricate diagrams of dense networks between corporations, government agencies, and think tanks, and media. Um, uh, foundations and so forth, uh, portraits and x-rays of elite rule. Now, it's good for social science institutional memory, collective memory, to be aware, of course, that what is now called neoliberalism and what is the inequality that is studied by Paul Krugman and Robert Reich for decades has been studied by J.K. Galbraith, C. Wright Mills, part of a tradition of Erpi, uh, labor notes, dollars and cents, The Guardian, and Bill Domhoff is part of that tradition also. So I'm happy, privileged to be able to welcome Bill Domhoff here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, by way of passepartout, uh, just one or two questions. Um, and more and more, I think that asking a scholar a question is like telling a frog where to sit. <laughs> While you are speaking, the frog has already changed places several times. <laughs> and by the time you get to the end of your sentence, you have forgotten where you wanted the frog to sit. Um, <coughs> uh, <laughs> so some questions. No, so I don't want any questions. I just have answers. The questions, the, <laughs> questions, the questions are extra, Bill. It's just the framing. What matters is the picture. Yeah, I'm going to ignore them anyhow. <laughs> so you also hold a professorship in psychology. And uh, you have written a book on the mystique of dreams. And the closing chapter deals with a much more modest theme, namely the mystery of dreams. And in it, Bill, very much in character, in a very sober note, you say, um, the news from the world of dreams is grim for most people, although there are exceptions to the rule. So this question may be superfluous, but nevertheless, I want to ask it. Bill, in your dreams, do the corporate rich also triumph? <laughs> <laughs> One more question then. Triumph of corporate rich, actually, actually, so what? Is the triumph of the corporate rich a pyrrhic victory which in the process happens to take the American economy down with it? Um, thinking about your theme, about your work, my mind wanders. And I scan books, I see books about rational choice, uh, elite deviance, corporate wilding, plutocrats' plutonomy, riches stan, the new elite, and I wonder, is the problem the elites or is it the institutions that enable the elites to get away with what they get away with? Well, I like the silence. It's a nice <laughs> silence. Let me start. Let me start. So, is is it a matter of comparing capitalisms, um, Anglo-American, Nordic, European, and East Asian, 
and by the way, of course, this isn't small talk. Uh, the World Economic Forum began yesterday in the Brazilian elections. Um, Bolsa Familia is now being criticized. In India's elections, the rural livelihood scheme is being criticized, etc. Economists have been talking about the euro and about the American government debt ceiling as doomsday machines. Is American so-called free market uh, a doomsday <coughs> machine in which deregulation, captive state institutions, um, a congress of millionaires, by the way, congratulations, um, in effect lead to the gradual erosion of the economy, its inevitable decline, eventually bringing down also the collective rich. So are we part then of a collective learning exercise, a collective amnesia experience, or a collective lemming experience? Um, now, in your words, finally, Bill, we always forget to be skeptical about ideas whose, whose time we wish would come. Bill, over to you. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. You're <laughs> I want to. I want to. I thank Jan first for for inviting me. I thought it was going to be a probably a pretty disorganized talk, anyhow, but. If I try to deal in those questions, you're really in for something for dis disorganization. Um, so I, I probably won't answer any of those questions. <laughs> um, which I had forewarned him in advance. I have more humble goals for the talk. I want to thank all of you for, for being here uh, to hear me out. Uh, before I begin, I do want to say a little something about that handout. If you don't have one, it's okay. The handout, in part way, is a cover for the fact I don't have a lot of fancy slides and all, and because I really want to talk about ideas. But this, the, the handout was also meant for context, context if you got to look at it beforehand. And it's also something I'd hope you'd take home and maybe think about. The first three pages really tell you something about uh, wealth and income comparatively in a real simple way. Uh, and you see this growth in inequality, which is going to be my concern today, is why did the corporate rich triumph so strongly uh, in the United States over the last 30, uh, 40 years? And basically what I found when I went to look at this with care was that they've really been trying um, things since 1939. And if we look at it in that context, we, we see something very different. The second three pages um, really refer to what uh, Jan was saying what this special issue, the insurgent sociologists, when we had all these networks and all these connections of people, and we were trying to get the mainstream to say, you know, to look at what we did, because it was like what they did. They didn't look anyhow. But the, the point is that you really can deal with the networks. You can show the networks that make the think tanks, policy discussion groups, and corporations are all one. They're all run by the same people. They're all financed by the same people. Um, the interconnections with government are indeed very, very dense. Um, luckily for you, I'm not going to talk about any of that kind of, of detail uh, um, here today. But I did want you to have that thing for, for later. Well, the title is Who Rules America Today? And of course, it answers in the subtitle. I think the corporate rich do rule. They are the people that run finance, manufacturing, retails, big ag, and, and real estate. And how do they rule? How do they do this? Well, it's all there for anybody to see. It's, it's all the stuff that's on. It's not in some deep latent this and that and the other thing. It's lobbying, special tax breaks, uh, that complex policy planning network, campaign finance, all the things that you've been exposed to. When wrapped up in, in the context of these networks and in the isolation of others that I'm going to talk about, the result is their success. And what do I mean by their success? What's the evidence that all this matters? Well, they win the legislative battles. Uh, their wealth and income have grown. Inequality has grown. Um, I will contend to you that since 1938-39, there's not been a single important legislative battle that has been won by the Liberal Labor Coalition. It won on Medicare, and it's won sort of on Obamacare, which was not what liberal labor wanted. But on the others, it lost time after time after time. 
they, these legislations were compromised, and that's what I've done in my most recent book on the uh, myth of liberal ascendancy, which I was not happy to, to, to conclude. Um, but I did go back through all of this legislation. I had help of others through compilations that they had made. And there have been losses on all of, of, of these things. So you can find details on all of this on my website, whorulesamerica.net, or in the Who Rules America, or in the myth of liberal ascendancy. Um, but I want to tell a more general kind of story today, a story of ideas that I think it can be uh, pretty familiar to you. And I'm going to talk in terms of the corporate rich, the corporations on the one side, and a liberal labor coalition on the other side. Now that's a big generalization in the following way. There are differences of opinion among the corporate rich. There's a moderate set of conservatives and an ultra-conservative set of conservatives. And I can tell you in detail, but don't have the time, uh, because I might answer some of Jan's questions at the end. But uh, the, the point is that that's detail for what we're looking for. What's important is what they all share. And all corporate rich share uh, fierce dislike uh, for unions and a desire to get rid of unions. Uh, they share a desire for lower taxes. Uh, they share a, a desire for minimum regulation of their particular business. And if I want minimum regulation of my business, I need your help and you want minimum regulation of your business, so we help each other. Even if it's finance, which is a disaster if you don't regulate it because you get runs on banks. That's okay, we all want deregulation, we help each other. Um, so those details then are, are, are of differences are unimportant. On the other side, there is a labor, liberal labor coalition that developed in the mid-30s, and it too has all kinds of divisions in it that you know many of you have lived. But certainly there's their differences among these unions, craft unions, uh, industrial unions, uh, there's differences among uh, uh, liberals and so on. I'm abstracting from that today, if you will, uh, talking more generally um, and trying to then give this sense of a much bigger kind of a picture. Okay, in that general picture, I also have used and will mention some of the numbers but not to, just to give you a sense of variation, and they're on that particular handout. But the point is, if we look very closely at what's called union density, what percentage of workers are in unions? And there's a couple, three different measures of that. Uh, the one that I've used on the handout is the one of what percentage of non-farm workers are in unions? I use that because it goes back further. But it's about the same. Um, and it's a very interesting kind of, of curve because it goes up and then it goes straight uh, down. I also use an inequality measure called the Gini uh, coefficient. And it does just the opposite. And that's what that funny looking first little graph is really about. And my talk is most of all about the first graph. Uh, the way in, it's the, it's the rise and fall of, of, of uh, union density. And the other side is the decline and rise of inequality. Uh, I'm not uh, claiming a, a causal relation, but I think this, they are the starting point for building a, a causal relationship, and I will give evidence of the kinds of, of, of things that did lead to those different kinds of things. I've also looked at um, a measure that was used in good, in good part by, developed in good part by a historian on this campus, El Elliot Brownlee. Uh, now, like so many of my friends from Santa Barbara and me are uh, retired, but he looked at the effective tax rate on the 1%. In other words, what do they really pay out of the, what they really get? And this is also a measure that has some dramatic kinds of changes that you will uh, 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 see um, at the appropriate uh, uh, kind of point. Now, I want to start by saying the key to understanding any country is to look at its history. Big, too big a comparative stuff, you get lost. Too big a structural stuff, it gets lost. The, 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 uh, the power structure is in the details of, of this particular uh, country. And you, it, what I now next say may surprise you a bit you know, in terms of saying how do a corporate rich triumph, because I think it really begins with two incredibly important differences 
uh, important historical understanding about the United States. The first is you cannot appreciate enough, emphasize enough, the historical differences between the northern and the southern political economies that hugely mattered in shaping the United States and certainly did into the 70s and the 80s and, and really uh, 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 still does. And because of the fact that the South was a slave and then Jim Crow economy into the middle 60s and still lots of exclusion after that, including then making uh, uh, uni unions anathema, there was no chance really for unions to develop except in the smallest enclaves in the southern United States. So a huge part of the country could not be part of a liberal labor coalition. Now that fact interacts with another fact, and that is the structure of our electoral system, which is just for pretty mundane historical reasons. We have a system that's called a single member district uh, plurality system. That is, we have two senators, we have a certain number of people elected to the House from each state in a district, and we have somebody elected called president who has tremendous power from this one big district called the United States. And you can win with 42% if the other candidates 41, 40, 39 down. And that system is, is not typical of the world. The world mostly has parliamentary kinds of systems. And some countries have systems where you get seats in the parliament depending on your percentage of vote. Uh, which turns out to have been a strategy by big businesses in those countries, but it still led to a more fair system than what we have now, and I shouldn't get off in those historical asides uh, to keep within uh, the time uh, limits. So the basic point is, you are stone cold nuts to start a third party, as Nader did, as the progressives did in the 40s and so on. I don't, I don't, I forgive people in the 40s, but I don't forgive anybody since then that started a third party because they could have read about what's happened to all the other third parties. But all our greatest leaders on social change, friends of mine, friends of yours, they were all for Nader. And Nader helped to elect George Bush. That's the point. You vote for a third party on the left or the right, you're helping the other side. That's what you're doing. And you couldn't tell Nader that. And you couldn't tell Chomsky that. And you couldn't tell Fran Piven that. And so on, down the list. Um, and Jesse Lemish gave me the whole 400 sociologists, political scientists, and other uh, uh, political leftists that, that signed for Nader. But vote for a third party is a vote for your worst enemy. Uh, that's the system. I'm not going to try to argue that with you today. But the point is the interaction of those two facts, one a very structural fact, one a historical political economy fact, they left liberal labor people with no place to go. They sure weren't going to go in with the Republicans. They were totally anti-union. They threw in historical reasons with the Democrats. This I call a sordid, sordid bargain because the liberal labor bargain with the South worked for them Somebody excluded in that bargain, guess who? It was African Americans are excluded from that bargain because it means liberal labor will not do much in the South and it means in terms, in, in turn in the North, for the Northern workers, great. The Northern white workers will keep the best jobs. And they had the highest jobs even in the industrial uh, kinds of unions. So African Americans really were excluded from this what was called the New Deal uh, coalition. Now, without any kind of a party base, organizational base, that could influence your consciousness about economics, about who's for unions, who's against unions, who's for you, who's against you, you're very likely to, dev uh, to uh, vote your other identities, which uh, can be very salient for people historically all over the world. Uh, and, and the first one of those, of course, is people vote their race very, very often. And we're going to see this in the, in the 60s. Secondly, they're likely to vote their religion in this situation. And there's been a difference in America for a long time. Tw say, say 75, 80% of Jewish people are voting Democrat. 20 percentage le points less of, are vo of Catholics are voting that. 50, 60% at one time. 50, 45 percentage. Now, Protestants, whatever their class, 20% less than the Catholics. So religion matters in American voting. Race matters in American voting. Recently, gender matters 
in Amer American voting, and they have trumped class, in effect, economic interest, uh, often in people's voting. And when that happens, uh, this gives an opening for the Republicans, because you can, you know, white people, bright white, ordinary people share a, a skin color with the rich whites. Uh, they might share religion uh, with the uh, rich whites and so on. Uh, well to do white women don't, that are married, live in the suburbs, don't vote their gender as often as uh, some other women might. So these are factors that I've just mentioned that provide openings then uh, for uh, uh, the Republicans. And the point then is then it's not somehow that our corporate rich are stronger than capitalists in other country. Uh, it's the fact that the potential challengers are more divided. They have organizational bases, they have some unions, there's churches, there's this and that. Uh, indeed, uh, if we look at what was the organizational base of the civil rights movement, it was in good part churches. If you look at the organizational base of the right in the 70s and the 80s, it's good part churches. The Catholic Church really funded the beginnings of the uh, anti-abortion movement uh, and so on. So the point is corporations not suddenly in the 70s, flex their muscles, get angry, and get organized. Uh, the situation that I've been talking about uh, changed uh, for them. And, and that's where I'm going to focus here. Well, this is global studies, so I, what about foreign policy? Um, and that whole global dimension. Well, with apologies, uh, in terms of the issue of inequality and power in America, that was a relatively minor issue until the 1970s, and even then it became a more important issue, in part because the unions had been so weakened by the 1970s that there was no way they could stop certain kinds of, of, of legislation. Having said that, uh, we have done studies, a couple of the articles in that very issue that Jan mentioned of the insurgent sociologists, were about the way in which these same corporate guys that I'm talking about did plan, starting in 1939-40, once World War I started, they began planning for a post-World world, post -world War world that would be international in scope. And they had it all scoped out of what they needed. They needed Southeast Asia because that fit with the Japanese economy. They certainly needed to be, penetrate the British Empire and the biggest fights the United States had in the 1940s economically were really with the British, open that empire or we're going to screw you you are now second banana. So that was a big fight from 40 to 46, was uh, hey, reversing positions with the British on who's, who's number one in the, you know, in the Anglo uh, world, if you will. Um, the reason that this internationalization didn't matter power-wise, the South and other right-to-work states fulfilled the same role. That is, you move the factory to Tennessee, you move the factory to Alabama. Uh, you soon move the factory to the Great Plains because right-to-work laws were passed, they were called, that really undercut, uh, made it harder uh, to develop unions. So they, in a power sense, those parts of the country played the role that is now played by China, or was played by the NAFTA and, and so on, or you know, com companies moving to Taiwan, which we would, you know, we're all upset about, or moving to here or there. But they used to move with just as devastating consequences to the Northern uh, Liberal Labor Coalition uh, to uh, those Southern uh, uh, states. So that's really the context then for that first particular graphic. And you can, and, and one point I want to make to you, which then gets me in trouble with the Liberal Labor Coalition, is to say, you can see the way in which, there's a certain way in which these big changes um, didn't have much to do with the Liberal Labor uh, Coalition. What they had to do with was first of all the Great Depression, which did then elect this New Deal uh, government, which in turn uh, did one thing, is starting in 35, 36, 37, they started to really tax the rich higher. And that starts to, to level things off, just a tiny bit, but, but some. And so the effective tax rate on the 1% then went from five or 6%, you know, up to 20 some percent. Uh, so they're starting to tax those uh, well-to-do guys. The other thing that happened in the 30s that so much matters that uh, relates to the context I just gave you was there was the passage of an act called the National Labor Relations Act, which put the government supposedly behind 
your right to, to uh, organize a union bargain. That act passed because the Southerners said okay. Why did the Southerners say okay? Because the Northerners said, hey, we need to pass this because we're after these corporations. But we're not after you. We'll exclude agricultural labor. You know, exclude also domestic labor. So all the servants, all of the, essentially the black workforce was excluded from this legislation. And the South was excluded, meaning the Southern rich. And the act passed. And it led to an explosion. The, uh, the um, union density rate went up from 9% in 1936 and it was up in uh, the 18% by 39-40, when there was now a stall. But there was a huge explosion of this union organizing. And it looked like, wow, this could go on. And then you know, you'll see why I say that. But something also happened that I want to put in the picture. It's like, uh-oh, sneaking in the bad guy from the side. And that is, as this uh, racially integrated union organizing started in the north and partly moved south, the southerners within that fast turned against that law because they didn't want it coming south, which it was. And they didn't like that at all through a union called the CIO. And from that day forward, they joined with their northern counterparts who had always been against this idea of unions to create what was called a conservative voting coalition in the Congress, which voted together. It's northern, a majority of northern Republicans voting with a majority of southern Democrats against a majority of other Democrats, of non-Southern Democrats. That's the coalition that rules on class issues in America since 1938, because in 1938, Roosevelt also made a wonderfully fatal, fatal mistake. And this is why, like, history is no conspiracy or somebody has a big picture and so on. Roosevelt, he did want to build the confidence of the business guys, so we'll balance the budget. So that and a couple other things, and they really stop doing pump priming spending. And you know what he did? He crashed the economy really like crazy. And now these people are out of work. It's harder to organize uh, these uh, resistant companies. Furthermore, you're un losing union members because they're laid off. And they can't pay union dues and so on. The 1938 election, in good part due to this res terrible recession, uh, put enough Northern Republicans back in Congress, because they were down to virtually none. I mean, I could give the numbers, but it was ridiculous. There were 16 Republican senators in 19, after the 1936 election, to give you an idea. Um, so, and there were like 485 Democrats, some of whom were Southerners in the Congress, in the House. So there were now just enough Republicans to go with these Southern Democrats for that conservative coalition to rule America ever since on all these legislative issues, except what you know these Southern Democrats as is as Republicans. In other words, they, they have the same stance, only worse on certain issues. So they, they are Southern Democrats incarnate plus extra as far as, as conservatism. Because you see, the Southerners needed subsidies for their agriculture. So Southern agriculture was saved as with other agriculture, especially the the plantation capitalists of the South were saved by the New Deal, a gigantic bailout of subsidies, which are still around today, of agricultural price supports. They send you money. Don't grow crops this year on cotton. We got too much. Here's the check from the federal government, a quarter for courtesy of northern uh, uh, voters and, and taxpayers. So there's two coalitions in Congress. There's a conservative coalition and there's a spending coalition. The spending coalition, that's welfare spending, that's spending on real estate, roads and all that. Then the Northern Republicans and the Southern, uh, Northern Democrats and Southern, Southern Democrats vote together. And they uh, feed each other. Uh, so agricultural subsidies go to the uh, uh, South and real estate subsidies go to the North. Many of you have read about this. Oh, it's the machine Democrats and they're delivering to the workers. Well, they were delivering to construction workers, but you know what? They were also delivering to the developers of big real estate in the North. And those people, it gets complex. Those people have to be immigrants into the United States, a whole lot of them, starting with the Irish. And you get a control of the city, and pretty soon you can put good stuff on your land. And then uh, you are oiling the machine with your, your money. That happened for all of the immigrant uh, uh, 
people of the last part of the 20th century in the United States. And they became these people in these northern ethnic enclave that, that were the machine, led uh, the machine Democrat. So that was the other cross-cutting coalition. And the northern Republicans didn't like that at all. But they had these common interests on these class uh, uh, kinds of issues. Now there was kind of a stasis 3940. It really